11th of March to the 15th of April. And anybody who's already booked for that date will have gotten an email and an offer to rebook for the new date. Um, Rory is going to Australia. Panty is a sellout, and they've extended his tour. So it's all for a good reason. So with that piece of housekeeping out of the way, I'd like today to introduce you to Cahill Gaffney. I'm not going to talk about all of Cahill's achievements, but they are pretty amazing. And Cahill founded Brown Bags, Brown Bag Films, excuse me, which is an animation studio. And uh, before he starts his talk, he's going to show you a showreel from Brown Bag. Yeah, I just, I'm not sure how many people in the room have kids or not. And uh, I think it's, if, if you don't have three-year-olds or four-year-olds at home, you probably don't know the work we do. So I just thought I'd um, play a two-minute clip reel of uh, the various different TV shows that we make. And then I'll rattle into the PowerPoint. Okay, um, so that's, that's what the day job is. Uh, I make cartoons of a Mickey Mouse business. Um, we, uh, we, we started off Brown Bag in 1994, and I'm going to go through the, the, the journey. Um, how does this work here? Um, can I click this on? Oh, here we go. Um, Sorry. Is there, is there a button I can use instead? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was going to go through the, the journey because it hasn't always been um, it hasn't always been as big or as busy. It started off as a very, very small company um, and it's grown organically over the years. Um, <laughs> technology is a little bit better in brown bag. <laughs> Um, I have a second. Is this touch screen? No, okay. Uh, so we, we had our we had our twentieth anniversary uh, last year. Um, so sorry, I'm just. See, I'm much better with visuals. I can't. <laughs> um, that's a bit. Oh yeah, so it is. Okay. No, so I th is this touch screen here? Okay. 
the timing won't be perfect. So anyhow, yeah, if, if you don't mind doing that until I get the clicker, thanks. Um, so th this, I, always, I, I like this slide. That if you go to the next one there, it just, um, th this is kind of, I feel like I'm slap bang in the middle and I still feel that we haven't kind of got to where we need to get to yet. Um, so it, for me, it still feels like it's a, it's a startup where we're only um, realizing our full potential and uh, we've, we've a long road to go before we, we get to where we need to. Um, but it is so funny when you're on the outside looking in and you're looking at our website, of course we, we don't show the squiggly bit in the middle, but um, that's really what it's like. It's, it's full of ups and downs and highs and lows all the way. Um, can we... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm much faster on the clicker. Um, can we go on to the next one, please? Thanks. So, back... So, where did it all start? Um, <coughs> I never wanted to do animation. I wanted to do fine art. But I couldn't get into NCAD because I'd failed maths in my leave insert. Um, so I said, well, I'll try animation um, because you can get into Ballyfermot with, um, with a fail in maths. So I went to college for uh, th three years and uh, then I got kicked out of college. Um, I got kicked out for making my own short films in my spare time because back then Sullivan Bluth Studios were in Dublin. And making films like American Tale, and they wanted everybody to uh, who entered a college, and it was, it was under an entirely different leadership. I should point out, um, it, we, we got on great with the college now, but we um, we they wanted us to be a feeder studio to work in these big American feature films, and I, I was like, I don't want to work in a studio. <laughs> I want to make my own short arty films. Um, little did I know that I was going to end up running a studio. Um, so after I got kicked out of college, um, I always kept that letter, and that's hanging on the, the, the wall in the office. And that's the, on one side is the letter to say you've been nominated for an Oscar, and the other one is saying you've been kicked out of college. <laughs> so, <coughs> and the guy who kicked me out has often tried to do LinkedIn connections with me, and I just haven't had the heart to accept it, you know. <laughs> but, um, so I'm technically the least qualified person working for me at the moment. Um, if you, Go on there to the next one. This is um, a mantra that you're going to see in the, in the years, the 21 years of brown bag. And this is something I put up on pretty much every business plan, every management meeting, um, and it's just about evolving. And I think this is such a powerful quote. Um, and and I, th I don't think Charles Erwin is regarded as one of the greatest um, business uh, people, but I, I, I live and die by this because I think you have to constantly evolve in business and what you do. Um, and the only thing that's constant is change. So um, this, this is a, it's a really important ethos in Brown Bag is, is all this uh, ongoing evolution. Um, can we go on? So I got 21 years, to, so I'm gonna skip through all the bad bits, <laughs> or most of the bad bits, um, and just go through uh, the, the, the early beginnings. So, after we got kicked out of college uh, with my classmate, Dara, um, the two of us got to lend a two grand from our parents and we founded Brown Bag. Um, we approached RT to do this TV series called Peg. Um, actually, that photograph is uh, down at the Galway Film Flower when I met Doc. That was in 1993 um, and we were staying in a tent and the, the tent blew away so we had to rob tarpaulin from a boat. But uh, it was... Back in 94 was the analog years. Um, animation hadn't changed in, in, in any time at all. It was it, like since Snow White was shot, it was all done on 35 mil film, hand painted onto acetate. It was absolutely antiquated, the whole process. Um, if you can move on there. Uh, so it was just a really basic thing. That, that girl, um, Val, she was, um, we used to use this dangerous chemical that was banned in Europe called GenClean. And uh, you know the health and safety wasn't really an issue, but it was very, very primitive, and it, it's really interesting to have worked on Steambex and 35 mil film, and um, because I've no nostalgia for the past whatsoever. They were terrible times, um, <laughs> and uh, if you go to the next one, and it wasn't until 1997 that we started getting into computers, um, and uh, we thought we were like NASA. We got our first computer in. And it was very, very basic. I think it was a Pentium Pro 200, and uh, you know, 
100 megs of, of storage was just ridiculous, but we couldn't even get a lease for it out of Ireland. We had to go to the UK because um, nobody, nobody would uh, give us a lease to get this um, software, which is, was only half as good as Flash is, but it was, it was quite innovative at the time. Um, and there was no internet. Up until then, we were doing service work, um, hand drawing and in betweening all these, uh, all these drawings, and we were sending it over to the UK um, so we had a photocopier before we had a computer, and we used to type up our invoices on an electric typewriter. I know it just sounds absurd, but I mean, it's, it's really not that long ago. Um, if you go to the next one. Um, so yeah, skipping through a couple of years of poverty there. Um, moving, <laughs> <laughs> because it was very, very difficult. We were doing bits and pieces of CD-ROM games. We were, you know, we were basically just um, making short films and, and really trying to scrape by um, started getting into the commercials, which was, um, which was, which was a real pain in the arse, to be honest. Um, the, the working in advertising is very, very difficult. Um, and then we got the Oscar nomination. It was a short that I'd heard on the radio, Give Up Your Old Sins, which you're probably quite familiar with. Um, so that, that was great. But that, um, we actually made Give Up Your Old Sins to put on our showreel uh, to get work in advertising. We had no idea that anybody outside the north side of Dublin would understand it, <laughs> let alone uh, it going on to sell 100,000 units in DVD and so on. So we've moved up to Great Strand Street at this place. Um, we were up at, that, at the back of Supermax and the, we used to smell of chips. Um, so we moved further up the same lane, uh, inching our way up to Smithfield. Um, and if we go to the next one, um, yeah, so it wasn't until 2005 that we did our first long-form show. It's when we took an option on Cat Little's short project that I'd seen at the Galway Film Fla, and we developed it into a TV series. And that was our first time doing a, a long-form uh, program. It was 52 episodes, uh, five minutes long. And uh, that, that was a great experience for us, and it really gave us a taste of, um, of you know, working with big international broadcaster, and um, doing, doing a show that we really enjoyed, you know, so work, work in, um, you know, developing our systems and our processes. So we, we found that we really adapted quite well uh, to doing long form work. Um, you can go to the next one, please. Um, then in 2007, we shut down our commercials. So this is about half, half of our um, turnover at the time. If you go to the next one, sorry. This would have been funny if I was able to click it. <laughs> Go to the next one. Okay. Yeah, sorry, hilarious. <laughs> um, so it was half of our half of our turnover, and um, the reason we shut down commercials was because we decided that we wanted to focus on one thing and do one thing really, really well, because the commercials were taking up taking up our, our lives. Um, every job is a total pain, and clients didn't know what they wanted. They knew what they didn't want after you'd do it three times, but they never knew what they, they were never able to give us a clear, um, a clear uh, message. In fact, we were doing a, Nikki, who directed Granny O'Grimm, um, we were pitching, uh, pitching a client this artistic mood board. We were talking about the color palette and a limited color palette, and it was a really well considered pitch. And the client said to us, um, <laughs> he says, well, I don't know about having a limited colour palette. I want all the colours. <laughs> and we were just going, Jesus, I hate, you know. And, you know, it was at that point that was like, we cannot work with these people. We have to get out. Um, so we shut it down. And honestly, we, we, we prefer to have done less work and less money than, than, than go down that road. So if you go to the next one then, um, we did our, we had about, four 3D people working with us when we got our first um, commission to do a 3D TV series. And we absolutely blagged our way into that, um, letting on with a huge big computer animation studio. But the people that we had were very, very good, so we did some really nice tests. And then we were commissioned, and then they came over to see us, and they went, really? <laughs> and uh, so we quickly scaled up, and uh, we moved then, if you go to the next slide, um, we moved up to Smithfield <coughs> around about this time and we got a state-of-the-art studio. 
uh, signed this ridiculous Celtic Tiger lease and uh, moved in into this custom designed place for, for computer animation. Um, if you go to the next. Um, and uh, yeah, so we were working on two shows then. We got Noddy in Toyland because the first show was working out so well. Somebody else came to us and, and we just loved the, the whole technology. We loved, um, you know, all, all the all of our work in animation to date, doing hand-drawn animation, coupled with our love of technology, we just thrived. We really enjoyed the whole technical process around that. Um, so doing two shows, which was ridiculous at the time for us, um, just saw us um, increase our numbers and our headcount and all that quite, quite a bit. Um, I think when we got to about 50 staff, um, that was the tipping point for us. I think once you go past 50 staff, then you're into all sorts of HR issues. Up until then, you can run a, a reasonably organic company. But uh, you know, things start to start tipping over as you move to systems and processes. Um, 2009, we got our second Oscar nomination for Granny O'Grimm. Um, and to be honest, I'm prouder of this than I am of Give Up Your Old Sins. Um, because I wasn't the nominee. I had nothing to do with this. My role uh, in Brown Bag <coughs> was very much to be the talent facilitator to create an environment where people can come in and develop their skills and develop their careers in the company. So Nicky came in straight out of college um, and he had a role affectionately known as a scan monkey. Uh, oh, I think this has been, uh, <laughs> better re retract that. But that was a very, very basic job where he would scan in drawings. And then he started doing these sketches and we, we encouraged him to do more. Then he started directing commercials and doing a short film and, and so on. So he really built up his whole um, career and he's still with us today and he's after directing uh, the number one rating show on BBC uh, called Bing, um, which is in the top 10 of all the shows on the BBC iPlayer. So the, for, for, to create an environment where that kind of success can be replicated was really a driving ambition and for that to have happened um, gave, gave us great satisfaction. So we went off to the Oscars game, which was pretty mad. Um, the next slide, um, yeah, so skipping, or skipping on there a bit, we, um, you know, moving up to, say, 2012, where, where we started working on Doc Mac Stuffins. Um, so this is a show that Disney had, um, they sent us over half a page of text, and they'd asked us to do some character designs. And then they said, um, we love your character designs, give us a quote for a 2D series. And we said, no, no, we can't do that, we're only 3D. And that was the end of it, we walked away. Um, and then we had a small bit of downtime, so one of our animators built Doc in 3D. And we modeled it and we sent it over to Disney and we said, um, here you go, I know you're not doing Doc McStuffins as a, as a 3D show, but this is what it would look like if you, if you produced it in computer animation. And then they came back immediately and said, okay, give us a quote, we're going to do this show, uh, it's going to be in 3D. So, it, you know, wh wh why we do service work? Um, doing service work like this is, you know, where you're really involved in the DNA of the show um, and all the above the line, you're, you're working on the art direction, the character design, your executive producers on it. Um, that's a different type of service work than just doing pure animation uh, for hire. So that's, that's gone on, it's like a massive global hit now and we're really, really proud of that. Uh, it's gone into season four and uh, so that, that's going great. Um, the next slide is more Disney. So Neve Sharkey came to us, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, and we have Henry Huggle Monster as well. So we were up past the magic 100 number. That's when all sorts of HR systems, you know, you have to, you have to be very much a co company um, by processes and procedures rather than oral tradition. So you, a lot of scaling problems um, around about that time. Um, you know, as you move from you know, you, you forget all the infrastructural stuff like accounts and IT and all of that. That starts to implode when you get to about the magic 100 number. Um, so that's the, remember I was going back about the squiggle in the middle? That's lots of squiggles around about this time. Um, the next slide. Um, and again, and again. <laughs> Constant, please. Um, so yeah, actually just keep rattling it until it's full up there. So just like last year, um, you know, we're very much technology company and um, we use technology to tell stories 
Um, four of the top 10 preschool shows in the world are produced in Smithfield. Uh, we have we have 13 hours of animation in full production, which is, you know, makes us Europe's big, busiest studio. And then Doc is obviously the, the, the number one show. Um, and people don't realize that Doc is made in Dublin, like, you know, black African-American doctor made up in Smithfield, like it's not an obvious uh, uh, thing, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's great. But if you go to the next slide, maybe rattle truce. Yeah. So, as I said, you know, 2015, you know, it's still very exciting. You know, we, we see a lot of growth. We're, we're going to be up over 200 staff at the, um, by the end of this year. Um, we're very much a product and a service business. We're into content creation, production, and exploitation. Um, and then we're moving, and I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about this, about where the whole market's going to go next. So it's, it's a very exciting kind of space to be in now. But, um, you know, you kind of you forget the, where, where, you, where you were earlier on. Uh, sorry, go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so a couple, a couple of points just about wh wh where I see the whole market going it's it's definitely going from a b2b business to business where brown bag and disney or brown bag and the bbc work together to a b2c business as well so then we're moving in we're going to work with um we're going to work directly with the consumer so we'll have our, we'll be competing with broadcasters for um for audience share um, and and uh, content producers uh, working together like with toy companies directly and, and games companies and so on and there's a number of those partnerships already in play so it's a very exciting time, you know, especially with all the 3D printing and all of that kind of stuff, tie that, tie that in with um, direct uh, channels to market. Um, so people, people get caught up about linear and non-linear, like non-linear would be random storytelling, like computer games and linear is your beginning, middle and end. Um, and it's like, I, I always say that that's like um, graphic design companies and web design companies back in the 90s they were you know one treated the other with mutual suspicion and it's like now the idea that you would go to a separate web design company for a website and a different one for for your logo design uh, seems ridiculous so i think games and there's going to be so much convergence and and uh, that over the next couple of years and um, because i do believe that over time there's going to be a whole bunch of smaller boutique companies and then a couple of really large uh, mega companies, so medium-sized companies like ourselves are going to struggle. So you either need to grow really big or stay really small. Um, so screen agnostic, I mean, that's, that's an important, like we're not a TV company, we're not a, a feature film company. A lot, like a lot of the thinking and the government strategy and that is around, let's have an agency for feature films in a cinema. It's like, it's, that's nonsense, you know, it should be about um, should be about content, and it's all about content. It doesn't matter whether you watch it on your watch or in the cinema. Um, so it's just, you know, we have to be screen agnostic. And the internet's just, you know, video-driven platform. So it's tons of opportunity for anybody who knows how to produce content to get it out there. So this is, yeah, like all the tools are there. They're so cheap um, to, to, to produce content now that the barriers to entry to getting stuff out to an audience uh, don't exist the way they did back in the early days. Um, that I think this is a fantastic time to be a, a producer. Um, but you know, everybody's going on about the iPads and this and that and the other. TV is still here to stay in, in, the, in certainly in the next uh, number of years. People are just spending more time looking at screens, but TV is still, uh, the, while, while the numbers are declining, they're just watching different things on, on television. Um, okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about Henry Hugger Monster. This is a um, property that we did with uh, Neve Sharkey. Uh, she's best friends with my younger sister, and um, we came across uh, Neve uh, a number of times. She's a fantastic author, and we were working with Walker Books and Neve on the development of this property. And uh, you know, we, we we pitched a pilot, brought it to Disney. And from the day that we took the option to the day that we sold it, it was nearly, nearly four years. I'd say about a year of that was contract negotiations. Um, but it was a, a big, long journey. So when you're developing uh, your own piece of IP, it takes a long time. 
Now, conversely, we've done shows that have gone into production after, you know, six, eight months, but that's absolutely the exception. Generally speaking, when you develop an idea, it takes at least a year to, to develop it fully with storylines and character bibles and, you know, animation tests. And then it probably, probably takes about six months to do um, all the contracts because there's, you know, you've really got to get into the chain of title and uh, contractual negotiations about the definition of profits as opposed to the actual profits. It's all bananas. Um, so, sorry, next slide there. Um, keep going there. Um, so yeah, so Neve uh, Neve has been working with us now for a number of years, and uh, we have 50 people up in Smithfield. There, it was actually it's not quite 50 at the moment, but um, it's about 50 people working on that show alone. Uh, it's done really well. It's it's number one show with two to four year olds, I think it is, uh, in Europe and Asia, and it's in the Disney's top 10. And it's there's a whole range of toys out in retail, you know, and. Without bursting the bubble of the business model of animation, um, animation exists to sell toys, and that's just that's just a fact. Um, the TV channels are there primed to sell you uh, sell you toys, and that's the whole business model of it. And for years, it was all, I thought it was all about the craft and the beauty of the the, the manufacturing of brilliant animation, but no, it's the, it's all about selling toys. Um, so. That's, you know, often we work on shows like Naughty and, and different shows like that where you'd be, you'd be working through an episode and the character would have to put their bag on their back and then the licensing person would come in with all their notes. Oh, give it three, three badges and this and that. And it's like, why? You know, it's like, because it'll sell toys, you know. So there's a, there's a little bit of that, like, um, you know, you're trying to make shows for the kids and then you realize that, no, you got to sell toys to the kids. And, and, that, that's, that's the thing that you have to wrestle with from the commercial side of, of animation production. But it, it's, um, it's, it's the economics, it's, it's what pays the mortgage, it's what does all, all of that. Um, so next slide. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit because uh, just about the triac structure. Very, I'm not getting into the triac stru structure, but Aristotle created that 2,300 years ago, the beginning, middle, and end. And if you go to the next one as well, I mean, the point I wanted to make is that um, people get so caught up with the technology and they get caught up with the, the, the channel in which it's watched, whether it's an iPad or whether it's a TV screen or, what, or a watch or whatever. It doesn't matter. Kids are only ever going to watch, and adults are only ever going to want to watch good characters and engaging storylines. It doesn't, it, like in the next slide. <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry, the next, it's just again, in, in, in another 2,000 years, you know, a good story is still going to be a, a good story, a good film is still going to be watched in a 1,000 years' time, you know? So don't get caught up with the, the technology and don't get caught up with the, the, the channel to market because um, so much, I, I see an awful lot of confusion when you get out there and people are pitching that it's going to be a, a web series or whatever without really considering um, what the actual content is about and who the audience is. Um, and that's something that I think tends to get uh, lost quite a bit is forgetting, uh, in, in animation generally, is forgetting who you make it for. Um, an awful lot of people make programs for the subsidy executives like the film board or the broadcaster because they have a relationship with particular individuals and they forget who they're making the program for and that's children. So if you're, if you're making a children's program you know, think of a four-year-old or think of a seven-year-old and have them in your mind rather than the person that's going to fund it because there's always a way to, to get a program financed. Um, okay, I'm going to go through a couple of top tips, right? So this is the, the these are some of the things uh, that, that I, I, uh, I suppose, I don't want to say impart wisdom, but the, these are the things if an older Cahill could speak talk to a younger call. These are, these are some of the things I would say, don't do that. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so in business circles, this is called alignment, you know, and this is, uh, you know, you have a business plan, you have a strategy, you have to get everybody um, pointing to the same North Star. And, and that's like, you know, there's an expression, don't be afraid to leave your business plan on the bus. You know, if you've got a vision, 
share it with everybody, share it with the receptionist, share it with the, not just the management team, share it with everybody in the company. So everybody knows where you're going and what progress you're making on that journey because it's not one individual, it is a team that, um, that will execute your plan. So if you're, if, you know, and this is just, you know, if you're running an animation company, I suppose, but it could apply to anything if you're doing an app or you're doing a, a short film. But once everybody knows uh, what you're doing, and I was at a Digital Biscuit here, um, and one of the guys, he made a great comment, and he said, like, um, he was talking about visual effects, and he said, it's like, you know, when you're making a film, it's like an Ikea flat pack with no instructions, you know? Somebody thinks it's a chair, somebody else thinks it's a table, and somebody else thinks it's a bookcase, you know? So you have to stand up and, and tell people what it is you're doing, where you're going, and remind them again and again and again. And I think that's one of the, the successes in Brown Bag is so many people are working together um, to achieve this, the same goal. Um, next one. And that's going back to the Granny O'Grim point. You know, there's an awful lot of ego in the creative industries. And I think it's, you know, recognizing where, where you are. And if you're always at the top, um, you, there's, there will come a point that you'll be the blocker for continued growth. And that's something I'm very, very mindful of myself, is that when is the time for me to step aside and have somebody else come in and lead the company? Because you've got to recognize that you may not always be the right person um, throughout that entire journey. And people evolve, and people have limits, and people have ceilings. And just because you're the head of finance in a smaller company doesn't make you the head of finance in a much larger company. So it's just being aware of your own, uh, your own skills and your own talent, um, and knowing when is the time to retrain yourself, or when is the time to step aside and let somebody else take over what you do. Um, but facilitating that and creating the environment is something that's, that's uh, very, very important um, to, to our philosophy. Um, next up. So yeah, growth and scaling problems were more difficult than sales problems. And going back to the squiggles, there were lots of them. Uh, you, know, going from, you know, going from a small company to a medium-sized company to a larger company is not without its problems. There's a lot of challenges. And especially when you're not from a traditional management um, background per se. I've had to go back and, and train in management and I've done a lot of different training myself but um, it, it is very very difficult if you're used to managing a smaller team of four people or 20 people going from that to 50 or 60 people takes an entirely different set of skills and uh, it's, it's very diff diff difficult um, and more so than the sales problem so going back to when we were when we were extremely poor, scrambling around for an ad and scrambling around for the next job, um, that was probably easier because we weren't pushing ourselves as much because we, we had the same amount of people and we were familiar and we were all friends and so on. So, um, you know, when you start getting into an environment where it's accountability and goals and strategy and all of that, people, people have to turn up the dial a bit. So that, that was one of the, the difficulties, I guess, in, in the years. Um, and the next one, yeah, I just, I, th I often think it's funny, like there's such a culture of piracy and people think piracy is like a, a they think of piracy like they think of a, a, like a utility like water, you know, it's like, it's, of course it's there for me. But then they complain when they can't get their own programs out on YouTube and they can't, nobody's buying their stuff. It's like if you're a content creator and you meaning, meaningfully want to sell your content online or anywhere else, don't pirate it. You know, get into the habit of spending your own money on buying content, renting from iTunes, because that makes you understand how a consumer um, will buy your content eventually. So I, ju I just find that an awful lot of producers don't, uh, you know, don't, don't agree with me on this, and they just think, oh no, it's grand, I'm not spending any money on content. It's like, well, but you're looking to get your mortgage paid from people buying your content. So it's, there's, there's quite an anomaly there. Um, next one up. Um, this, is, this is something that we've learned over the years. It's, it's higher to the company culture, not to the CV. Um, 
I, I think um, this is really important because when you get the wrong people into your organization, it can absolutely destroy your company. Um, and it's so important to, to recognize when you have, um, when you've, what your company is and then hire to that culture. So, sorry, if you skip on there. And in Brown Bag, we have dogs. Typically, there's about four dogs walking around the studio at any given time. And when we interview people, like, you've got to say, do you like dogs? Because if you hate dogs and you're going to have a phobia about dogs, there's no room. I don't care if you've come from Pixar. You know, you can't, you, you won't fit in with the company culture. You're going to be, you, you just won't get, get on with all of us in there. So it's just knowing who you are, knowing what your philosophy is, and sticking to it. And it doesn't matter where you come from. Because when people don't fit that culture and they come into the company, they completely, uh, you know, kind of a very, very uh, negative impact on the business. So um, just to be very aware of, what you are, I'm very proud of that. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but you know, just be, know who you are and then hire to that uh, environment. Um, <coughs> okay, this is something I wish I could have told myself years ago. But you know, people, there's a lot of template contracts out there, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of intellectual property theft. There's a lot of different things going on out there. It's a very, very murky world. Um, spend more than you can afford on the best legal advice. I mean, it's, it's, it's really worth establishing uh, good legal boundaries in, in the work that you do. Um, I always say good fences make good neighbors. And I think um, that's so important. If you've got an idea or if you've got a contract, if you're working for somebody, no matter what it is, once you know what the, what the guidelines are, what's expected of you, and, and you know, the definitions of all of that, then, then go ahead and, and, and do business. But we, you know, we've, to, to, to our expense, we've wasted time, there's been opportunity costs, there's been a lot of different things that we've done over the years. Um, and I'd strongly recommend if you've got, you know, to, to get legal advice on any piece of IP or contract uh, that you might, might, don't try and do it on the cheap, don't ask a friend, you know, get, get, get proper legal advice if, if you value uh, what, what it is. Um, you and your staff are your greatest assets, so invest in training. And that's something that's, that we really believe in. We, we have a percentage of a, a couple of percent of our payroll that goes on training, uh, you know, constantly training. And, and I say you and your staff because the, the intent is that if you do training, it's for a very specific skill for a member of staff. Well, don't forget your own personal development and your own ongoing skill so that, you know, if you finish up with a college degree or, you know, conti conti continue to go back and retrain yourself because it's just the most important thing that you can do. You can constantly evolve you and your personal development as well as uh, the team around you. Um, and that's something we have a very strong philosophy on. Um, and you know we try and build people up doing short films or send them on training courses or have buddy systems and but we, we have a big philosophy around that. Um, back to that point, just to really re-emphasize it, make programs for the viewer, not the commissioning editor. Like know who your audience is. Um, and you know, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're, if you're making a program for a child or for an adult, know who that adult is. Have, have um, have a picture of them in your mind. Is, is it eight-year-old Johnny from Mullingar, or is it you know, 40-year-old Mary from you know, Leitrim? You know? But know who you're making the program for, because um, you're not just making it for all, all ages. You really have to understand the audience. Um, and you know, tying in with that previous point, like I went back to study child psychology last year because I didn't want to be you know, referencing my own kind of circle of two or three people because you really have to, to, to get under the skin of the audience if you're going to make content for them. Um, and persist. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, that's just the most, you know, you know, working for yourself is the best thing and the worst thing in the world, uh, often on the same day. Um, it's, you really have to be very resilient and stick with it. Uh, it takes, there's a great quote about this uh, by Calvin Coolidge, but uh, it's, it's a brilliant, um, 
it's a, it's a great quote. We used to have it on a, our, our wall for the first number of years of when we were scrambling around to, to buy lunch. But, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, it pays off if you persist. And that's just not, not just on a company basis, that's on developing a project or, or working through a problem. Now, the next slide uh, will we'll say, no, that's a lot of nonsense. Uh, will, you, will you fail fast and fail cheap? No, you know, so it's, it's about knowing where the balance is. It's about knowing when to stop trying and to, uh, you know, cut your losses and move on because um, that's, that's a great expression that fail fast, fail cheap. I've heard it many times. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's just about knowing when, when to stop. Like, you know, optimists are typically people in business and typically the worst people to see, this is nonsense. Nobody's going to buy this or no, what are you doing that for, you know? So you've got to understand yourself and be really critical on yourself about why do you continue to invest time and, and money on a, on a particular um, pet project. Um, next up then, and this is so true, I suppose this applies to every, everything, you know, sell trust first and program second. It's, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very much, the, the kids industry is very much a personal uh, business and, you know, I don't think anybody has ever jumped across a, a table and pitched a program to a stranger. You know, it's, it's often, um, it's, it's always people you know, you establish relationships, you establish trust, and then you sell to them. Because people want to work with people, because um, you're going to be working on a TV show for 18 months. It's going to be extremely stressful. There's going to be nothing but problems. Um, and it's how you deal with those problems and overcome them. So you've got to, you know, establish rapport and a uh, similar set of values and so on. Um, okay, so I said I'd wrap it up. That's kind of it. So I'm more than happy to go through questions and, and, and so on now. So, um, okay. That was really wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering if you could say something about the partnership that you set it up with another person and you've talked a lot about how the company needed to evolve, but did the partnership evolve or is there anything you could share from that? Um, yeah, so myself and Dara, um, we set up the company together and uh, we're still 50-50 um, equal shareholders. Um, it's literally been like a, a marriage, like we're still good pals, we see each other every day, uh, we work through stressful situations, so you know, you have highs and lows in any kind of relationship and maintaining, I, I always say a, a year in business is like dog years, it's like seven years in your normal life, you know, so it's like, I'm probably, how many years is that I'm married to him now, you know, but it's, it's, it's um, you, you do have to evolve and it's, uh, you know, I suppose, you have to be 100% honest all the time, you know, and it's all there because of trust. Um, so, yeah, like, I mean, we have evolved as people ourselves, you know what I mean? I'm a very different person than I was 20 years ago, um, and so is Dara, but we're still, you know, together with the same vision. His role is creative director, and I'm the CEO. So we've, we've different jobs in the company, so he, He's very much a creative. He's currently directing the new series of Octonauts. He's, you know, he's on the board. He's, you know, full of ideas. But I'm day-to-day -day management, CEO, you know, new business, da 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 da. So uh, we have very, very different roles, but you know, we we're, we are joined at the hip as well. Yeah. Could I just ask you, as you look back, who was the most important customer that you got? In, in terms of strategic or, and strategic or whatever turn for the business, and how did you get them? Um, yeah, it's tough. Uh, I, I I don't know. Like I mean, it's, I suppose it, it's the easy answer is to say somebody like Disney because that's the most current one and that's the the biggest uh, the biggest shows that we're doing. Um, I suppose you know in the in the, I suppose hit entertainment with Nickelodeon on Wobbly Land. That was our first long form show. That gave us, that was a pivotal moment for us that said, 
okay, let's shut down commercials, let's move into long form, let's do one thing and one thing only. So that's, the, that's probably the, the most strategic, pivotal customer, I, bought, I suppose. Um, yeah, I suppose going back to sell trust first and second, we, we, we got to know the people from going to markets. I mean, you'll get no work in Ireland. You know, that's part of the problem in Ireland is that there is no opportunity for us. I would love to be doing work for the Irish market. Unfortunately, there is no work. So you have to get your passport and go to the airport and go over to London, go to Cannes, go to all the different markets. I'm more than familiar with airports at this stage and, and always have been. So. Um, yeah, so we just got to know them, and then we pitched them the project, and they uh, they, they they bought it. And one last thing about in, in the early days of that, what gave you credibility in, in terms of you know? I, I'm sure Ireland was a disadvantage at that time. I'm I'm, I'm just trying to get at the, the barriers you overcame to sell yourselves to these people against other more presumably credible opposition. Um, I suppose, I don't know, I've always been extremely enthusiastic about what we do. I've always loved animation, loved making stuff for kids, and I guess that came across. Um, I really can't say, I, I, it's always about the quality of the project. So if you really believe in the project, like often I go to a market and I meet a Canadian producer and he's got 10 projects and he's saying I can get 40% of the finance, da 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 da. And I'm looking at him going, you don't even know me, you don't even know the projects, who's it for? Um, there's a lot of uh, animation that gets made just purely f through s tax subsidies and shelters and da 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 da, da. And uh, I guess that's never really appealed to me because uh, I'm not from that financial engineering kind of part of the brain. I'm much more about the, the enthusiasm about animation. So I think if the project is right, you'll always find a way of getting an audience for it. The name Brown Bag. Um, we, when we left college, um, we we uh, we applied to RT to do a TV series called Peg, based on Peg Sayers. And um, as I don't know if you did Peg in school, but um, it, when we were filling in the form, it said name of company, and I was there to talk, and I says, "What do we do? I don't know." It's like, uh, "Have we got a company?" Yeah. So we looked around the room, and there was a brown bag there, and uh, so he says, "Yeah, brown bag films." <laughs> it's like. And it said directors, and we thought that was like the directors of the show, not the directors of the company. We didn't have a clue. Like. <laughs> so we got the contract, actually, and we went back in. And I remember saying to Mike Kelly and RT at the time, saying, so does that budget include VAT? Like, you know, and he was going, Jesus, you know. It was like, <laughs> we were really, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering, Carl, um, what do you think uh, Ireland could be doing to provide better support for people in the creative industries? And per specifically, do you think there's any role for a university like Trinity College in that? Um, I suppose there's two questions there. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 in terms of industry support, uh, yes, I, I do think that there needs to be a greater joined up thinking am among the, the different funding agencies like Enterprise Ireland and the Film Board. You know, things like the Creative Capital Report kind of were great initiatives. There's loads of great ideas, largely all uh, ignored. I mean, you know, that's the problem about doing brilliant reports is they, they just get put in a shelf. Um, so there's no shortage of ideas out there to say what would make an industry and develop it from a particular cult of uh, production, you know, because uh, there's a, a very small number of producers in a particular genre that get all the subsidies uh, and I think that needs to be uh, that needs to change um, now going back to the I, I think the tax credits in Ireland are, are absolutely brilliant they're in every western country around the world with the exception of the US but um, that really gives Ireland Inc a, a superb competitive advantage um, over, over other territories um, I think uh, whether Trinity College, yes, I, I do think. I think uh, there's lots of opportunities, but I think you know, expanding beyond being just an animation college and being a, you know, content and all the all the different support services from coding and all of that, because you know, I think 50% of Pixar staff are are coders and programmers and and so on. You know, so it's it's 
you know, figuring out a way where the creative economy can merge with the, with the, with the colleges. I think it's a lot of opportunity there. Hi, Cahill. Um, I'm Sarah from the Educate Together National Office. I was really struck when you were talking about the, uh, the culture, I suppose, of your organization as it grew from two guys sitting behind a, a, a chipper through to what it is today with a massive staff. Um, and I really enjoyed hearing about, I suppose, the, the, the cultural growth that's happened both for you as an individual leader um, but for the company. And of course, I'm familiar with the work that you've done uh, with, uh, to, rush with, for, to Rush With Love and, uh, and so on. I suppose that CSR aspect of your, of your company, the sort of giving back to community, is that something that grew by design or was that something that sort of organically grew from you as a leader and as a person and from a, a culture of people connecting? Yeah, we, we do quite a lot of work with that. Um, like, I mean, it's something we, we, we do a lot of giving back to the community and, and we did a, recently we, we did a thing called Book Bag, which we went back to Rutland Street School, which is very underprivileged in uh, Dublin 1, uh, where, and that was where Give Up Your Old Sins was recorded. And we, um, we gave every kid uh, a book, and we got a writer in residence and a, an illustrator in residence. And we're trying to establish that like, as, a, as a national scheme. We've got a second scheme coming up in Ballymun, and the idea that it might be like a coder dojo where anybody can go along and just you know, have links to all the different uh, uh, where you can get the books at wholesale price and so on and do it, do it in a particular school. But we've done a lot of stuff. We do a lot of stuff at Temple Street and all that, so there's a ton of charity work that we, we get involved in. Like, it's a big ethos within the company. So they're always fundraising, but it's typically always for kids, though. Question. Yeah. Given that you've been in brown bags now 21 years, is there any time in the involvement of the company that you think is your favourite time? Um, I suppose it has to be now. I mean, okay. I'm truthfully, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. Uh, I, you know, really love co going into work. Um, it's be careful what you wish for as well. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's very stressful and difficult and it's not easy. Um, no, but, it, but it, it, it is now, yeah. It's, yeah, I don't, I don't have any, you know, no, no regrets, you know, everything brings you to where you are, you know, and, and uh, yeah. And just one other question, sorry, but just in terms of the people that you hire, and you hire creative people and technical people, project managers, account managers, maybe talk, tell us a little bit about how you go about doing that. How do you recruit the creators? How do you recruit the technical staff? Um, about 25% of our staff are international. We can't get them from Ireland. Uh, so we've, it's like the UN up there. We've got people from Argentina, Brazil, uh, New Zealand. I mean, pick a country, Russian, uh, a couple of Russians. There's an Indian guy. I mean, it's very, very hard to fill the roles. We're at a very high level of technical skill, um, coupled with, you know, animation and creative skills as well. So, um, you know, like core programming skills, like we have a technology R&D team, and we have an IT team, and we have a pipeline team. So there's an awful lot of technology goes behind the company. So we'd, we'd be competing head to head with all the IDA companies looking for coders and programmers. Um, from an animation standpoint, um, there's always going to be a gap when the industry uh, accelerates so quickly against um, colleges. You know, typically colleges move at a certain pace and then the industry is driven by, by the market. So um, there's a skills gap uh, from graduates that we find, but we're working, we, do, we have a lot of programs uh, through our Manchester studio, over in the UK and through, uh, through the colleges here as well. So, um, but all the recruitment is done up online. It's, it's all very process driven. I mean, loads of, you know, I, I don't even get involved in it to be honest. I don't even know who's applying anymore, you know, so I, I haven't done an interview in a long time. So, but, but it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very big thing. So there's always, if you are looking for jobs, there's web, brownbagfilms.com forward slash jobs. I think there's about 10 jobs there, and there's going to be, be another 40 anyhow by the end of the year. So, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sinead wants to ask a question. Sorry. 
thanks. You know, as you said there yourself, you can't always find the staff here in Ireland and perhaps you're not getting the jobs from the Irish market. What's making you stay? We're, we're Irish by geography. We're not an Irish animation company. Like we're 100% registered, pay taxes, all that stuff. We're 100% Irish company. But um, we don't see ourselves as an Irish animation company in that respect because we do work for, we don't do any work in the Irish market at all. We have no customers. I don't think, I can't think the last time we did any work in Ireland. So, um, so we, we, we're Irish by geography. So, um, yeah, and I love it here. It's like, you know, so that's, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, um, despite the lack of commercial opportunity in Ireland, is this the golden age of Irish animation? But you kind of killed that there yeah. with the answer. Um, like there seems to be a like a huge growth in, in Irish animation, Irish animation companies. Yeah. Um, do you think that's going to continue, or like how do we support those? No, I do. It's it's um, it is fantastic. I remember, you know, it's not that long ago trying to get. Um, insurance on the car and they said what do you work at and work in animation and say oh we don't have that uh, we have abattoirs we have accountants <laughs> um, and now it seems to be a bona fide uh, career option so that's you know it's very exciting to see like i think there's about a thousand people working in animation in ireland uh, between all the studios and the freelancers and so on and um, we work very very closely together all the studios uh, there's an organization that uh, called animation ireland uh, AnimationIreland.com is the website, and it's a, you know where we work together to promote Ireland Inc as the best destination in the world to produce animation. So we don't see each other as competition; we see each other as co-opetition, I suppose, um, where we try and support one another, share information, uh, and are very, very supportive of one another when they when they secure a contract. This completely unnerves the international market, whereas all the English are all you know miles apart and not talking and <laughs> Canadians are the same and and so forth whereas the Irish we all huddle together and hang out down in Cannes you know um, but uh, but it is definitely a golden age it's 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 there's no doubt about it um, but I but I would say that you know it's a golden age to produce animation it's a great environment for animation but don't the domestic market is gonna you're gonna struggle but it's a great place to start, to do short films, to do uh, small bits and pieces for the local broadcaster and so on. There's, there are exceptions to the story, but certainly my business model wouldn't work in Ireland. So. Just to kind of expand on what you just talked about actually, um, w could, could someone in this room do what you did today? Like could you start off as two people who, who got kicked out of college and and start their own company and, and become a, a, a really well-known animation studio, would that be possible today? Or should we come work for someone like you? No, I, I'd say go do it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the reason I went through all that, you know, the poverty and the two grand bank loan was not to kind of say, haven't you done well? That's to kind of say like, look, you know, you, anybody can do it. You know, there's nothing, you know, you know it goes back to persistence, you know. If, if you've got a fire in your belly and you want to do something, do it. And just run through walls and make it happen. Um, you, know, that, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is uh, like I suppose I was a reluctant entrepreneur. I didn't intend to set out um, to, to, to set out. I didn't have a business plan. You know, we didn't know what we were going to do. It evolved. And there's a hundred different ways to set up your own business. But of course, people can set up and create the next brown bag and, and Brilliant, you know, I think, yeah. But come and work for me as well, though. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> we'll take another couple of questions. Uh, so I was going to ask, do you think you need a business plan starting out, or is the organic approach more favourable? Um, you know, okay, so I mightn't have had a business plan in the early days, and it wasn't until after we finished PEG that we said there was no work, there was tumbleweed. We thought we'd... Uh, we were going to get loads of jobs in and nothing. The phone just didn't ring. And uh, we were, you know, then we said, OK, let's set out a plan. Let's do this. Let's go to England and see, can we get some service work? Let's go over to Annecy. Let's go to these markets. So we, st we always started writing down our goals. 
and we often look back at them now and laugh out loud because they were so basic. But we always wrote down goals in the most basic form and measured ourselves against them. So we have a very sophisticated system now, but back then we were writing diaries and there was swear words and everything in them and they were hilarious. But um, we always had a goal that like, if we're going into a year, what are we going to do? And we used to write our own press releases for what we would do uh, after the event had happened, you know? So like kind of writing a press release in it 12 months in advance. So we always had a, had a vision where we wanted to go. But, uh, but a business plan just helps facilitate your, your, your thought process. We have one up there right against the wall. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Carl, thanks again for the talk. Uh, just for my own area of interest, can you just tell me a little bit about how you approach, say, music on your animation? Is there a particular, you know, what kind of criteria do you, do you go for in terms of commissioning that? Yeah, um, that entirely depends on the project and the client. So, um, for instance, on a Doc McStuffins show, like, I mean, you, 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 you would, uh, I think it was about five, six different musicians got to score uh, four minutes of an episode. Um, and to get on that scoring list, you had to have a track record of doing uh, kids TV programs. It's, you know, you really have to understand the subtleties of children's music and, and animation series as opposed to doing music for drama or live action or documentaries or whatever. Even though, you know, most musicians are very, very versatile. Um, but typically, um, they, they like to see lots of examples, even demo examples of, of work that you've done. Um, on our own stuff, we, we tend to work with, we have a couple of composers that we work with, one in particular, Darren Hendley, and he's, he's done tons of work for us from Octonauts to Olivia to Naughty to, you know, and he started off doing spec music for us on a short film because we had no money. And um, that was back in 97, he did work on The Last Elk for us, and we've been working with him ever since, and, and we've put him forward, and he's now one of the top musicians. We can't even get him, he's doing work for, BBC separately and, and, and so on. So um, I'd say try and get to do some work on, on some shorts, some spec work, do some recompose soundtrack for Octonauts or something or you get on the in online and use that as a demo track. Okay, we'll take this as the last one. Okay. Hiya, how's it going? Um, I was just wondering, if you had received like more business training at the beginning, do you think brown bag films would be different? Yeah, that's yeah. I suppose, I suppose, of, of course, you know, um, yeah, probably. <laughs> Just like I mean, it's I, it it will be different, you know. I mean, like everything, everything that you do, it's like you know, dominoes. Like everything has a knock-on effect, and you know, things. You know, you, it's like your CV. You kind of look back and you kind of make it look like a carefully crafted career path, you know, and really it was just a mess scrambling looking for jobs, you know. Um, it, it's, it's a, yeah, it'd be interesting to think um, where, where, it would, where it would go. Um, but to be honest, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't like to change anything though. I, I have enjoyed the process and, and the struggles, but uh, yeah. You're, but you're right, yeah, I, I, if you want to set up your own business, learn the basic skills of business. Absolutely get finances right. Don't do what we did, you know. Uh, learn, uh, you know, don't, don't have the sheriff looking for your fat return because you don't know what it is, you know. Things like that are very, very important when you're starting off in business. Um, so absolutely get the, the basic business skills, you know. Uh, you sh should read books and, and, and all of that. It's, Strongly recommend this. Great. Well, I think we'll end it there, and I want to thank you all. For thank you. Yeah. Didn't work at all. No.